Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss further the prospect of uh, when rather than if Boris Johnson will be made to stand down as Prime Minister based on the political calculations that his would be successors and the wider parliamentary party of Tory MPs will be making. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So I've alluded to some of the factors which will determine when Boris Johnson steps down recently. Uh, but now that the North Shropshire by-election results known, and it was, a, it was a fairly brutal defeat for the Conservatives, it's time to go over all of my thoughts on this. And it was, it was worth waiting a couple of days as well, <laughs> just in case a load of MPs instantly submitted their letters, or in this case, emails of no confidence, making the entire discussion largely moot. Given that we've had no word that this has happened, I'm going to work on the possibility that the, indeed the probability, that the vast majority of Conservative MPs are being a little cautious right now. Obviously, the announcement of Frost's resignation at the weekend could throw some political calculations out of the window. But we need to remember that Johnson's fate is down to a few hundred Conservative MPs, nobody else. Some of them are rational, some are not. Some will have reasons rational reasons to want him gone quickly. Some will have rational reasons to want him to stick around for longer. What I'm saying is the timing of Johnson's departure is difficult to ascertain. It could be that there's a leadership contest announced by the end of today. Doesn't mean he'll be losing it though. It could be that there's no leadership challenge for many months. You know, we don't know because there isn't an obvious best answer for all Tory MPs. And even then, you could only predict it if you assumed that most behaved rationally. You know, he could still be in place this summer. That's, it sounds at the moment like things are moving quickly. He could still be in place this summer. Or the leadership challenge could be triggered this week. Like I say, might even be today. Who knows? I suspect not. It depends where the balance of interest is perceived to be. And in this video, what I want to do is split up the parliamentary party into two groups. And with each of those groups having two subsections. You know, the two groups are leadership challengers, those who want to take his job, and non-leadership challengers, those who just want to enhance or entrench their position, so they need to pick the right one. Then you've got subgroups for each of them. You know, you've got those who see benefit in a quick succession, and those who want to string it out. So the challengers first. Now, the main ones that are frequently mentioned are Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, Priti Patel, Dominic Raab. There are others. <laughs> that sounds like a grim bunch. There are others. And the next Prime Minister may well be one of the others. But these four have been the most vocal about wanting to replace Johnson. In fact, both Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have been quite blatant. Last week, Rishi Sunak was letting it be known that he was not in favour of the Plan B restrictions that resulted in the largest Tory rebellion Boris Johnson had ever known. An odd thing to do under normal circumstances. Why the challenge to, to the Prime Minister's decision unless you are trying to build up a support base? Also, Rishi Sunak has been in the United States where he was meeting with private health care providers under the radar, wasn't announced. We're told he's coming back earlier than planned. Why do that? He says it's to help deal with Omicron. But what can a Chancellor do to help deal with the Omicron rise here? Well... He could provide more funding for businesses or individuals affected. Is he planning on doing that? No. So why come back early? Because if there's an imminent leadership challenge, he doesn't want to be caught stranded out of the country and lose early momentum. And I don't think Sunak wants a quick leadership challenge. He's lost ground in the popularity polls amongst Conservative members. His epic tax rises have not helped him there. You know, he will surely want Johnson to remain until he can deliver another budget where he slashes taxes to get them back on side. Maybe he's even come back to persuade colleagues that now's not the right time to drop Johnson. Yes, he must go. Of course he must go. Just not yet. Liz Truss, on the other hand, may feel that the time for her is right. She's popular in the parliamentary party because of her worthless Brexit trade deals that they just don't know are worthless. But she may not feel that she has any more rabbits to pull out of the hat at the Foreign Office, Dominic Raab's political graveyard. She has been whining and dining Tory MPs, according to reports. 
So she's definitely building up a support base. She may want to urge colleagues to act now rather than later because she may feel that she's not going to remain as popular or certainly not enhance her popularity as time goes on. You know, we may well be getting a little internal tussle going on between the potential challengers who are ready to go now and those who think they would be more ready later this year, you know, not just yet. So then what arguments could be employed by, for the massed ranks of Tory MPs who effectively have to decide it one way or the other? Now, I've said before, the political calculation must surely be between whether the damage is centred entirely around Johnson or if it is doing damage to the wider party. If the damage is entirely blamed on Boris Johnson, there's absolutely no rush to get rid of him. In fact, there's benefit in keeping him on for a while longer. The pandemic is still raging. Brexit is still a disaster. It's going to be more of a disaster in a few weeks. The economy is tanking. If the party get rid of him quickly and install a successor by, say, March, that successor sure can still blame Johnson for the mess they found themselves in. But this time next year, the public will start to expect some, some good results. Why not let Johnson take the flak for 2022 as well as 2021 and 2020? pass more legislation that will make the next general election much less fair, get closer to that election date, then drop him, get an instant bounce back in the polls, then go for a general election in 2023 when the opposition haven't got time to, to really focus on, on the new prime minister. But this assumes that the damage is entirely centred around Johnson, that if they drop him, that they will instantly bounce back in the polls. Now, they may do. I think there's a good chance they will. You know, and it also, you know, assumes that they can manufacture a healthier looking economy. Certainly Rishi Sunak has already laid the groundwork. He's been fiddling the figures to make the economy, ironically, look much worse now than it really is. It is still bad. But he, in his last budget, he, he fiddled figures to make it look even worse so that next year he can release a budget that makes it look much more optimistic. Getting ready for a summer 2023 general election. Now, having done all that does him no good at all if he is not either the Prime Minister or the Chancellor by then, because then some other bugger will use this dodge and get the credit. But is the damage centred entirely around Johnson? Because if you look at the result in North Shropshire in isolation, you would imagine so. It was quite clear the Conservatives lost heavily there because of the scandal surrounding Boris Johnson. That was the main reason coming through strongly when voters were questioned. There were a few other side issues, but that was the main one. But in June this year, there was another Westminster by-election in Chesham and Amersham. Another safe Tory seat that the Liberal Democrats took from the Conservatives. Not as safe as North Shropshire, but still. And that was before the big scandals engulfed Johnson. Now here, the disquiet was over Boris Johnson's general direction. Not personal flaws, not personal baggage, not the scandals. It was a Remain voting area, not by a huge margin. It did vote Remain by, I think, 55% to 45 There was also a feeling that the Conservatives were taxing them to pay for improvements in the north of England. Now, I said a long time ago that this would be a major battle for the Conservative Party at some point. By capturing so many seats in the north of England with promises of big spending... They created a fracture in their own party between the Red Wall MPs who want that spending. They want to be able to show their constituents the benefits and the Blue Wall MPs who don't want taxes going up to pay for it. I mean, neither are getting what they want. The taxes are going up, but it's not translating into spending elsewhere, just covering the hole left by corrupt COVID spending. Chesham and Amersham was seen as a result of what the Conservative government was doing, not specifically anything around the personal baggage of Boris Johnson. So if Tory MPs see that result as more important than North Shropshire result, then they may also see that there's a general problem with the current direction of the Conservative government. So that will need more careful management, a problem that can take longer to fix. And so the sooner you start that process, the better. Another consideration as well, as a direct result of Johnson's reckless abandon, many individual Tory MPs came under the spotlight. For example, it wasn't a particular secret that Geoffrey Cox did no work as an MP and was being paid a million quid a year in order to advise wealthy clients how to get out of paying British taxes. 
but it came to public prominence in the wake of the Patterson corruption scandal, because then the media started reporting on a load of others. Now, some of those media had been reporting on them in the past, hadn't really broken through to the public. Now it was. Johnson shone a spotlight on them all. If Johnson hadn't blundered in, most of the public would not have started paying attention to the dodgy second incomes of like a quarter of the Conservative Party in Parliament. If Conservative MPs think that keeping Boris Johnson in place much longer invites more opportunities for their own dodgy activities to be placed under the microscope, they may be minded to act sooner rather than later. But then there's the final consideration. Now, I don't know. It's possible that a confidence vote will be triggered very soon. Maybe Johnson will be forced to resign sometime next month. Certainly Covid might once have been an opportunity for him, but is now a potential stumbling block. But I think there's more chance that rational Tory MPs will want to wait. And that is because there is no obvious replacement. If they do not get a replacement that makes good on the promises of infrastructure improvement and cannot appeal on a personal level to those working class voters that nicked in the North, there are a lot of Conservative seats many of them only newly won, that are going to be lost at the very next opportunity. There are more than a few Tory MPs being quite vocal that what they want is for Boris Johnson to retain his campaigning skills and roguish charms, but drop the sycophants that he surrounds himself with and stop being so blatant at ignoring his own rules. But this is like asking a vampire to, by all means, patrol the streets at night, make us all feel safe, but can you stop biting the necks of young maidens, please? The scandals, the sycophants, the endless damaging baggage is Boris Johnson. He isn't carrying it, it's him. They don't seem to understand this. And the reason is that they can't afford to understand this. Because they have so little confidence in Sunak, Truss, Jav you know, Javid, Patel, Gove, or any other potential successor to wield the same magic that they're completely trapped. Can't keep Johnson because he's too expensive. Can't get rid of him because his successor will be an epic gamble and could be just as bad, you know, with the added problem that they may split the party on issues that even Johnson doesn't. Of course, all this thinking is what a rational Tory MP will be having to go through and discuss with their colleagues. And even then, it's not obvious what conclusion they should draw. Should he go quickly? Should he go later? But not all Tory MPs are rational. Maybe they will drop him when they should keep him longer. Maybe they will retain him when he should be shown the exit immediately. We will see. But I do think that most of them will still be minded towards caution. Because apart from anything else, if they get rid of Boris Johnson quickly, then his successor will still have to deal with an ongoing Covid problem, ongoing Brexit problems, ongoing economy problems. Much better to let Boris Johnson cop the damage that is still to come in 2022 and then get rid of him later on. But we'll see. We will see. Who knows? Uh, but those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.